Hey everybody, uh, we're continuing chapter 21, amines and derivatives. Um, and we're, I think, on uh, number 9 now. This is the Hoffman elimination. It's different than the Hoffman rearrangement, not rearrangement. Um, what what does elimination mean? Where have you seen elimination before? Um, so it's generally when you do elimination, you create alkenes, and that's what's going on here. So it's a reaction that creates alkenes, and it it. Uh, we eliminate uh, quaternary ammonium salts. Quaternary ammonium salts, which are those weird nitrogen things with four things on them. Okay, so there's a couple steps. One is we make quaternary ammonium. Which we'll review how to do that. And then we eliminate with base. Because remember, usually with elimination, you got a proton, you got a leaving group, you react with the base, and the base attacks kind of from the back. Sort of like that, so uh, kind of like a E2 style mechanism. Okay, all right. So that's the basic idea then for this elimination, this Hoffman elimination, is that if we have an amine, what we're going to do is first methylate it with methyl uh, methyl iodide or iodomethane. Whoa. And this is exhaustive, so we do this multiple times. We methylate it until it can't methylate anymore. So we go exhaust exhaustively. Right? And, um, Your charge. I think there should be maybe a charge. Where's the charge? Charges on nitrogen. And uh, yeah, okay, so we have a quaternary ammonium salt. Quaternary ammonium salt. Why is it called a salt? Well, because the um, because it's plus charge nitrogen, uh, negative charge iodide. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a salt between a positively charged thing and a negatively charged thing. Okay. Now we react with um, NaOH. It usually is a second step. So this causes the elimination reaction. All right. And when we do this, there's kind of two two ways, two different protons we can eliminate. Remembering the elimination takes off the neighboring proton, kicks off the leaving group, and makes an alkene. There's three arrows, and let's write E2. That's kind of like a standard E2 type reaction. Strong base takes proton, kicks off the leaving group, makes the alkene. All right. And um, yeah, so there's two protons we could imagine removing HA or HB. And and if we take off HA, we make one alkene. And if we take off HB, We take out, we create another alkene, right? 
So you create one alkene or you can create the other alkene. All right. And if you think back to organic one where we made alkenes by elimination reactions, we gave these things names. We call this the Zaitsev product. And this is the anti Zaitsev product. Zaitsev product, anti Zaitsev product. Okay. And why were they called Zaitsev and anti Zaitsev? What's the meaning? Zaitsev is more stable. More stable on the left. More. And the anti Zaitsev is less stable. Why was the why was the this left one more stable and why was the right one less stable? Less not not less Zaitsev is less stable. It is less Zaitsev too, but it's um, yeah. Okay, so left one's Zaitsev more stable, right one's anti Zaitsev less stable. And why was the left one more uh, stable? Uh, thinking back from organic one, and I'm not going to review all of that, uh, you hopefully remember something about, you know, when, when an alkene has more stuff on it, more substitution, it's more stable. So this is a disubstituted alkene, right? Because we have a carbon there and we have a carbon there. It's a disubstituted alkene, right? It's actually a trans disubstituted alkene because the stereochemistry is trans. This alkene is monosubstituted because it's got one carbon on the alkene. And uh, yeah, it's got one carbon on the alkene, so it's monosubstituted. So disubstituted, monosubstituted. And the left one's more stable and the right one's less stable. So then the question is, when we do this Hoffman elimination where we took an amine and we methylated exhaustively, and then we have the quaternary ammonium salt, and we treat it with sodium hydroxide, which product forms? Zaitsev or anti -Zaitsev? Okay. Usually at this point I have people raise their hands if they think one thing or another, but we can't do that. So, you'd think, oh yeah, let's make the more substituted, more stable thing. And the answer is no. It actually makes the anti -Zaitsev. It's an anti -Zaitsev elimination. Okay. And there's a reason for that, and, and that, that's the, in a nutshell, it's because when the base is trying to figure out which proton to take off, it, it, the, there's a big steric effect of all the methyls. So the methyls affect the steric hindrance around these two sites, and HB is easier to access by the base. So even though the product is less stable, Kinetically, sodium hydroxide has an easier time getting to HB, so that's why the anti zaitsev product dominates. Okay? All right. Okay, so real quick review about elimination from E2 and this, this concept of like Zaitsev and anti Zaitsev. E2 reaction from Chem 233, organic one. Um, so you may or may not remember this, but we actually did see cases of anti Zaitsev back then. So if you have a bromide like this, what we learn is, depending on the base you use, we can either get Zaitsev elimination or anti Zaitsev elimination. Okay, we have an alkyl halide. So this is organic one stuff. And um, so which bases would cause Zaitsev elimination and which bases cause anti-Zaitsev elimination? Well, the answer was that it was kind of small, sterically non-hindered bases like NaOME, sodium, sodium methoxide, NaOCH3 or NaOME, those give Zaitsev, whereas big bases like 
potassium or sodium terputoxide, huge bases, so where the base is really large, it has a steric effect also where it actually wants to, you know, it's easier to take off the right side proton. So we have H, A, and H, B just as well. Okay, so that was kind of how we explained Zaitsev, anti Zaitsev, regiochemistry, inorganic one. Okay, and yeah, the word is regiochemistry. Regiochemistry, which you could maybe say like what region of the molecule is being reacted or whatever. Okay, all right, so now. I have this tendency to draw E2 as subscript, and it's actually not. It's supposed to be a normal size 2. The thing that's subscript is, is if you're doing SN2, it's a subscript N. Okay? I always make that mistake. All right, so what we're seeing now, though, in this Hoffman elimination, is that if we take a... Um, Uh, primary amine, and we treat it with methyl iodide or iodomethane, and then a NaOH. What happens, is, as we just learned, is that it'll methylate exhaustively and it'll then do an anti zytep elimination. So there's a plus charge on the nitrogen. Maybe you can see it, yeah. And, and so it would, um, where would it eliminate? It would eliminate on the uh, right side to make an anti zytep alkene product. Uh-oh, I messed it up. Okay, so that's the anti of product. Great. Show another one. Um, okay, so we'll do this amine, and we'll do methyl iodide, sodium hydroxide. Add a methyl there. Okay. All right, so we exhaustively methylate. And we have our quaternary ammonium with a plus charge on nitrogen, right? Okay, and then uh, let's show the elimination. What are the, what's the, what are my protons? Well, there's one called HA. There is HB, okay? And which one of those gives rise to the product? Well, between HA and HB, it looks like not HA, because that would be Zaitsev, maybe it would be HB to give the elimination product. Whoops, sorry.
right? With HB, you'd get this elimination, but it's actually not HB, nor is it HA. It's a different H. <laughs> What's a different H? Because again, you're trying. The base is going to find the most sterically open, uh, unobstructed proton, right? Well, let's look at that molecule again, and now uh, you might be able to see where the other proton is. That will even be less sterically hindered. Let's draw a nice big plus sign on nitrogen. Okay. And where is it? It's actually up here. HC. Okay, so there's actually that proton, and that's even less sterically hindered than HB. And remember, the rule has to be that for elimination that the proton has to be next door to the leaving group, okay? So if HB would get taken off, yeah, you would make this product. But HB is not the most sterically unhindered neighboring proton, right? HC actually is. So when HC gets deprotonated, and I'll draw that mechanism, base takes this proton What actually forms is alkene, a two carbon alkene. And and a tertiary amine. Okay. That one's a little tricky. Uh, yeah, so that's what actually happened. We methylated the am this uh, secondary amine exhaustively, which just meant we added two methyls. And then when we, you know, HA was certainly not going to react in the elimination. HB, you'd think might, but the best is HC, as I'm drawing up there, uh, because that's the sterically most uh, unobstructed proton HC up there. Okay, so the base takes HC, that forms a two carbon alkene, and it also breaks off the plus charge. Let's draw that nicely too. Okay, here's our plus charge in nitrogen, and now we see the elimination that occurs, and that actually creates a tertiary amine product as shown there. Okay, so that's a pretty cool example. Definitely a nice kind of tricky one that people use on quizzes and exams and stuff like that. Okay, all right, cool. Hoffman elimination. All right, so that's it for this chapter, chapter 21. Um, there is a reaction at the end of the chapter. It's called the Manic Reaction, M-A-N-N-I-C-H. Uh, we're gonna skip that one. Um, it's, it's a cool reaction, but we don't really have time for it. And you're certainly welcome to read about it in the book and be taking an advanced class, advanced organic chemistry class. Uh, you, you'll learn a little bit more about the Manic Reaction. Okay, so yeah, we're gonna jump to chapter 22. All right, so let's see. Um, we're on to chapter 22. New chapter. I think this might be the second to last chapter, so we're almost done. Uh, chemistry of benzene substituents. All right, so um, we are returning to our friend benzene and uh, some of the some additional reactions to learn about benzene derivatives okay so you're gonna have to review some of your old reactions and reagents all that fun stuff uh, we'll do some very long like 10-step benzene synthesis reactions here shortly okay um, so number one uh, stability of benzylic radicals
Now we've we've learned about benzylic before. Benzylic means uh, next door to a benzene, so not on a benzene, but next door to a benzene. Um, I also to double check the spelling. It's one L, not two Ls. So just in case you care about spelling, I, I misspell almost everything I write down. Uh, so we'll also talk about benzylic bromination, which is just bromination of the benzylic position. Okay. So recall, um, that if you take uh, toluene, methyl benzene, and we react with Br2, um, what kind of director is a methyl group? It's a slightly electron donating group. Um, and you might remember it's an ortho para director. And so you might expect the para product to form, except that it doesn't work because um, because that's not the reagents, right? It's not just Br2. You have to add something else. Remember what we have, we have to add? We have to add a chemical that has a metal in it, and it's Br2 and FeBr3. Remember that? So that works. And that was electrophilic aromatic substitution, EAS. The mechanism, and I'm not going to review that whole thing, but it was roughly speaking, it was methylbenzene and Br, Br, FeBr3. Remember that? And this is a super electrophile complex. Super electrophile. And that the various positions of this could attack this. Uh, it, it turns out to be favored at the at the uh, para position. Of course, you could you could draw the mechanism from the ortho position, the meta position, or the para. But the para is the most favored due to the uh, steric effects. And right, because it's an ortho para director. It's a, uh, the methyl is an ortho para director, so it's directing to to the ortho positions. Um, and meta is not favored. So it's either ortho or para, and ortho has a slight disfavorance due to the, the CH3 group because of sterics. So that's why we get the para, right? Remember that? That was chapter 16 or something like that, a long time ago. And this, this is what we call EAS, right? EAS reaction. All right, so that's kind of old stuff. Um, all right, so... Um, in the presence of light, though, uh, a different reaction occurs. When you react methyl benzene with Br2 and uh, light or heat. And in that case, this actually goes back to organic one. It's like the first reaction you learned in organic one. Um, is that it's an, it's an alkyl bromination. So actually the CH3 group gets brominated through a radical mechanism. Okay. Um, if you do the same thing for chlorine, It also works, but it keeps going, and you get multiple uh, CCl3. You get trichlorination, so you get um, multiple chlorines attached. So it's a little more reactive. So usually, if you if you just want one halogen, like as a leaving group, you would probably use Br2, and then not not chlorine. Okay. All right. So let's. Review the, let's review the mechanism briefly of, of kind of how that worked. This is technically an organic one mechanism. I'm not going to ask you this mechanism, but um, we'll, we'll review it just in brief terms as a radical reaction, because you haven't seen too many radical reactions. Uh, I'm not going to ask this one on the quiz so, or exams or anything. Okay, so quick mechanism. 
how does radical halogenation work? And this is this is again a a uh, first reaction you learned in organic ones a long time ago, huh? Um, so there's an initiation. And so the Br2 breaks its bond, you get Br dot, you get two Br dots, right? And then propagation one, and we have propagation two. Prop one, prop two. Okay, so what does propagation one do? It rips off. the hydrogen from the substrate. So that's phenyl CH3. So these are three fish hook arrows. Kind of a little hard to see that. Um, but yeah, the BR dot is a fish hook. And then we're, let's draw that better. Okay, there's a there, that's CH3, right? Let's let's draw that a little nice and big so we can see this. Okay, so yeah. Three fish hooks. Br dot takes the the hydrogen atom. Hydrogen takes its electron, one of the electrons, and it forms a bond to, HP, to Br to make HBr, and then we have a fish hook that goes onto the carbon atom, and that forms a carbon radical. Okay, still a little unclear. Sorry. <laughs> BrH. Then we have phenyl radical. Okay, phenyl is a benzyl radical. So it's a, a phenyl CH2 radical. So there's two hydrogens, and yeah. All right, so then propagation two is that, let's draw that nicely. It's a phenyl with two hydrogens and a dot. And now that reacts with more Br2 that we have sitting around. And that forms a product. Okay. And then we have some various termination events. That's what, kind of, what I call like step D, which is essentially radicals finding radicals. And that sort of stops the propagation from occurring. So a good one is just BR, BR finding BR. BR dot finding BR dot. Fish hook, fish hook. Other things could happen like phenyl CH2 dot and another phenyl CH2 dot form a bond. If any of these things happen, it stops the propagation. That's why we call it termination. Okay? So, yeah, that was benzylic uh, rumination as a uh, reaction you learned in organic one. All right. Oh yeah. So, um, why does is there something special about a benzylic radical? And, and you know, why why does this reaction occur favorably next door to the benzene? And the the answer is is it's actually stabilized by resonance. So, so the as we're gonna see. The benzylic position is stabilized by resonance for radicals and also carbocations and also carbanions. That's the main point, one of the main points of this chapter. Okay? Alright, so. So if you draw, I'm not going to. Do it exhaustively. 
But if you draw a benzylic radical, which is what, essentially what you're forming right above, um, there's a whole bunch of resonance stabilization of this. And, and um, you draw a resonance stabilization of radicals the same way that you draw that for like a cation or an anion. So it's, it's like fish hook, fish hook, fish hook, three fish hooks. And that shows a new re a radical resonance structure, right? Yeah, and then this one, it's just three fish hooks each, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the stability of a benzylic radical. So you can, sh you can uh, draw all the resonance structures and it, it resonates all the way around the ring and then eventually makes its way back to the CH2. Okay, so yes, they are highly stabilized. That, that kind of radical is much more stable than like, like, like this radical, like a cyclohexyl radical, right? That has no, no stability. It's a cyclohexane radical. Yeah, there's some special stability that you get when the radical is next to a benzene. Okay, all right. So, and like what I what I'm leading to is that stability of a radical next door to a benzene, a benzylic radical. Uh, also, you know that happens for other things like cations, a plus charge or a minus charge. They all do the same thing. They have extra stability at the benzylic position. So let's consider cations. Stability, benzylic, carbocations. And we'll talk about the SN1 sulfolysis reaction briefly. Back to organic one again. And um, just re remembering another key reaction you learned from organic one that if you have a tertiary bromide and you react it with like I don't know ethanol right uh, that a reaction occurred this is one of those maybe chapter 8 or 9 I think um, where the ethanol kinda got attached right and it was a it was a, um, you know, roughly speaking, the, the bromine just went away and you made a carbocation. And then ethanol attacked, lost a proton, whatever. And yeah, it's an SN1 reaction, right? SN1 reaction back in that, that period of our organic chemistry knowledge. And, and the reason this works is it's because it went through a it went through via a stable, relatively stable tertiary carbocation. A stable tertiary carbocation, right? Remember that? And this is a nice bond, and that's a nice bond. Okay. Yeah. And so this this occurred really well for tertiary. What else did it work for? Um, it could SN1 would also happen for secondary. Um, did it work for primary? It did not. Solvolysis, which is a carbocation mechanism, if I do it for this cyclohexane with a methyl primary bromide, and I do the same thing, you might think the product would be something like that, but it's not, and it doesn't occur because you'd be going through a primary carbocation, right? Unhappy primary carbocation. 
Okay, and so, but what if it's a benzene? So it's primary, it's still primary. But does this reaction go, and would it also go through an SN1 style carbocation mechanism? And the answer is yes. And the reason is because this actually is a stabilized um, a stabilized carbocation. When bromine goes away, and it goes away without any assistance, the bromine just pops off. Now we have a CH2 positive charge. Well, this is a stabilized benzoic carbocation. And yes, the positive charge, the, the, now in this case we're drawing resonance with positively charged species. The double bond chases after positive, right? So the double bond goes towards positive. With a radical and also with negative, it's like it, it goes from the negative or the radical and it goes away. But here's the, the double bond goes towards it. So I'll just draw one. I'm not going to do all of them. Whoops. Right, so yeah, you have a new positive charge there, then this double bond goes there, and it keeps going around and around. And that that explains this the resonance stability of the carbocation. And that explains why this reaction works. Even though it's a primary bromide, whereas like a normal primary bromide, it would not work. Okay, because it would be an unhappy primary carbocation. Primary carbocations are extremely unhappy to the extent that they don't form. Okay, all right. All right, number three, stability of benzylic anions. And when you think about anions in organic chemistry, especially carbanions, you kind of think about alkylation, right? We've seen that with like enolates, we've seen it with like alkynes, alkynal anions. And so, um, recall that most hydrocarbons have a really uh, non-acidic pKa, non-acidic pKa, so if I draw like cyclohexane, and I think about the pKa of it, because it's, you know, it could be maybe deprotonated by a base, and the way we measure that is pKa, and it's like 50 or 60, so it's like a huge number, very, very non-acidic. So there's not a base in the universe, to our knowledge, that will deprotonate cyclohexane. Okay, um, but uh, the benzylic position is moderately acidic. And that's because when you deprotonate the benzylic position, it's a resonant stabilized carbanion. So, um, if we, now it's, the pKa is not like, it's not super low, but it's like 40. pKa, like 40. And a pKa-40 proton can be taken off uh, with a strong base, like in beta lithium, which is that. It's, a, it's a, one of our super bases. So it will rip off that proton, and that'll give us CH2 dot dot negative a benzylic carbon ion um, and it has a resonance stabilized thing I'm, I'm gonna 
not draw all the resonance structures. Oh, I'll draw one where like the negative dot dot negative kicks in and kicks onto the that left carbon. So that's one resonance structure. You should if you you know if you need practice, you should probably draw those resonance structures. It's a good exercise for resonance. Yeah, so dot dot negative kicks down, makes a double bond, and then this double bond breaks and pushes onto that there. So yes, there's a whole bunch of resonance structures. That's also kind of a, that's a, a common organic one exam problem. Okay, but then we have this and we can do stuff with it like attack a alkyl halide. So then this would attack and give us How many carbons? One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. A four carbon piece. So this is a, a useful, a synthetically useful nucleophile that we can attack stuff. We can attack ketones. And butyl lithium rips off the proton. Attack ketone like acetone, what's the product? Rip off the proton, you have a negative, a dot dot negative, just like a Grignard almost, right? And then we attack acetone. And we get a tertiary alcohol, right? So see if you can do the mechanism for that, right? One more example. We'll use paranitrotoluene. Remember, uh, that's called toluene, right? Methylbenzene, toluene. This is paranitrotoluene. Um, well, what's the pKa of these normally? We just saw it was not 60, not 50, it's about 40. But this one's actually pKa about 20. Because the nitro can stabilize the conjugate base. There's a re re additional resonance stabilization of the conjugate base with nitro. So you could push the uh, negative charge, take off the proton with butyl lithium and push it all the way down to nitro and it's a resonance stabilized thing and thus the pKa is a lot lower so butyl lithium is uh, almost overkill but let's just draw the... we'll use it anyway, it's, it's a good strong base you might be able to use a weaker base though there's nitro Okay, so yeah, see if you can push the negative charge from there all the way back here, and that kind of shows stable stabilization. But for fun, we're just going to attack a different electrophile. Oh, we did an uh, alkyl halide, we did a ketone, let's try an epoxide. Okay, followed by water. So the C, the carbon negative charge, is it going to attack? the left side of the epoxide or the right side of the epoxide? Remembering those rules. Where's the attack? The left side or the right side? Because uh, the epoxide, remember, it negatively charged nucleophiles, basic, or we'll say non-acidic nucleophiles like, a, like this, it's a strong base. It will attack the least hindered side of the epoxide. So it will attack 
there. So the carbon will be attacked, attached to that carbon. And then it'll be a, we're attaching a one carbon piece with a three carbon piece. And the product will be there, roughly, where the, where's the negative, where's the OH? So here's the new bond we just formed, right? And if this carbon attacked this carbon and kicked onto the neighboring carbon, is the OH there or there? Because we attacked a three carbon piece. And remember, with the, with the way that epoxides get opened, the, the carbon will attack there and then it'll put the uh, OH right here onto the neighboring carbon. So, just like we learned with uh, Grignard's attacking epoxides and, you know, alkynes, the OH will be on the neighboring carbon uh, to, relative to the squiggly line. Okay? Yeah. All right, great. Um, benzoic oxidation. All right, so benzoic oxidation. What does this mean, benzoic oxidation? So we can, there's certain uh, oxidation reactions that occur at the benzoic position. Um, these are often kind of non-selective. Non We're gonna show an example with KMnO4. KMnO4, no mechanism for this. But this is an extremely powerful oxidizing agent. And we, we say it's often very, it's very strong. It's non-selective, so it's not not used that often in organic chemistry because it's such a insanely strong oxidizing agent. Um, but we'll just as, as an example, you know, what what did KMnO4 do to a benzoic to benzoic positions? So here we have. Uh, Methyl on one side, propyl on the other. Yeah, and KMnO4 as a super insane strong reducing agent, it will wipe off, it'll cleave both bonds. It'll cleave both of those bonds off and give you a dicarboxylic acid. So it cleaved both CC bonds. It cleaved this one, and it cleaved that one. Probably, uh, uh, where did the, the CA, where did that carbon go? Probably made CO2. I'm guessing CO2 was formed when that one cleaved. This one probably made uh, propionic acid, a carboxylic acid. So these are kind of the byproducts. Uh, wait, uh, yeah, one, three carbons. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah. Okay, so it's an insanely strong, non-selective reducing agent. Um, it probably requires benzylic CH to work, because there's something special about benzylic CHs, right, in terms of radical stability and things like that. So most likely, um, the mechanism probably involved some for kind of radical formation, like pulling off the CH to make a CH2 dot, or maybe pulling off that position to make radicals. And we'll just say radicals, probably a radical mechanism, okay? It's an interesting example. Um, if you take a similar molecule with a tert butyl on one side and isopropyl on the other and do KMnO4, which of these things has a benzylic radical? Well, not the tributyl, but yes, the isopropyl. And so, um, so the left side is immune to this reaction. The right side, somehow those other things get kicked off. I'm not exactly sure what the byproduct is, but they all get cleaved off. And so 
I guess the no the notable thing is there's no benzoyl CHs here on the tripule, and that's why the tripule somehow survives. Okay. We'll say NR, no reaction on that. But other things, with benzylic carbons, they usually just get cleaved and wiped off, and you just get carboxylic acid. No easy mechanism for this reaction. Okay, so now we're going to show a, a case of rather than an insanely non-selective benzylic oxidation, which is to make carboxylic acids, let's actually show a selective benzylic oxidation that is more well-behaved. Okay. So we can also do a mild selective benzylic oxidation. Um, if you have like a benzylic alcohol, we'll say, make the molecule more interesting. We have a benzylic alcohol and also a primary alcohol. Um, if we think about normal oxida oxidizing reactions, you know, like PCC, it would uh, probably oxidize both of these, right? PCC would oxidize that to a secondary, right, to a ketone. This would be oxidized to an aldehyde. Is there a way to selectively oxidize the benzylic position? And the answer is yes, and the magic oxidizing agent is MnO2. We've also seen this, I think, for allylic. So allylic means next to an alkene. Like if you have an alkene, and you want to oxidize an allylic position, I think it's MnO2. And I want to say you saw that in the notes previously. So it's the same oxidizing agent. It's selective for allylic, which is to this, and benzylic, which is this, next to benzene. And it'll selectively oxidize the benzylic position to a ketone and not touch the, uh, the primary alcohol. Okay. Okay, number five. So we're done with benzylic oxidations, either uh, harsh non-selective oxidation with KMnO4 or mild selective oxidation benzylic oxidation with MnO2. Let's do benzylic reduction now. So we did oxidation, let's do reduction. Benzylic reduction. Okay, so recall how do we reduce a alkene to an alkane? Organic one stuff. Alkene to alkane is simply H2 palladium on carbon. Right? And we have a name for that. It's, uh, you're adding hydrogen. You're adding hydrogen to the molecule. It's called hydrogenation. Hydrogenation. A-T-I-O-N. Hydrogenation. And the palladium is a catalytic uh, reagent. So it's catalytic hydrogenation. Okay, um, now what you're going to learn is that if you have a benzylic ether, benzylic ether, this is a, or a benzyl ether, A benzyl ether, so it's a benzene with a CH2 and an oxygen. And we treat this with H2 palladium. You'd say, well, that's totally different than this. Alkene to alkane, this is a has no alkenes, the benzene's not an alkene. Um, 
But this actually causes a cleavage reaction. So this rea that bond gets cleaved, the uh, benzyl uh, carbon oxygen bond gets cleaved. And so the product is actually a primary alcohol and toluene. Okay, and that's kind of weird. Uh, we haven't seen too many examples of how, um, well, bonds get cleaved for one, right? How many times have you seen a bond get cleaved? I mean, not, not that often. Like, like if you have an organic molecule with a, a bond and just wipe away the bond. Uh, yeah, and also using hydrogen to do that. You haven't really seen that before. Okay, so this was catalytic hydrogenation. This is not called catalytic hydrogenation. Uh, it is uh, catalytic, but we call it hydrogenolysis. Hydrogenolysis. What does lysis mean usually? Like cleavage. So this is like a hydrogen mediated cleavage reaction. Hydrogenolysis. Okay, cool. What's the mechanism in a nutshell? It's pretty easy. I'm not going to review it here, but essentially H2 gets absorbed into palladium and then the H2 is delivered to the alkene. It's going to be something kind of like that though for this. So simple mechanism, here's H2. There's the metal surface, H2, uh, palladium, palladium metal surface. Dot, 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 dot. So H2 is kind of hanging out above the catalyst and then two electrons go this way, two electrons go that way. So now we got H2 absorbed onto the metal surface, right? So you got the H2 absorbed onto the metal surface, okay? And essentially, the way you can draw this now is RO. So that's the benzyl ether. It's a some kind of carbon, RO, and then we have a CH2 and a benzene. This now gets ready for a another concerted reaction where and I don't know the air the direction of the arrows, I don't think it really matters, but I'm gonna go. So it's like a concerted reaction where oxygen is getting a proton from hydrogen, well, essentially hydrogen on catalyst. A, the, this uh, pair of electrons goes on to the catalyst and then this H gets delivered to the benzylic position. And that explains the formation of toluene, right? So now we've, we form the primary alcohol, we form toluene, okay? Cool. Well, so now we know that benzyl ethers can be taken off from a molecule. Of course, benzyl ethers can be um, attached really easily too. And do you remember how to make the ethers? It was uh, maybe organic one, I think. Um, was the Williamson ether synthesis? Anyway, so let's jump into number six, which is using benzyl ethers as a protecting group. Because we can put on benzyl ethers and we can take them off. That's the whole point of a protecting group, is a temporary masking of a functional group. So let's think about how we might do this synthesis. So we're going to react with this alcohol the bromo alcohol. Okay, and we're gonna do, we're gonna say, hmm, let's go from there. We're gonna transform it into
this alcohol, this dye alcohol. All right, so how are we going to do this crazy synthesis? And we're going to try to highlight the use of a, of a benzyl ether as a, as a protecting group. So, kind of, I mean, if we look at the, if we compare the molecules, we see some resemblances. I mean, it looks like we have a three carbon piece, one, two, three, and then here's a one, two, three. So that kind of suggests maybe this three carbon piece is the same as this three carbon piece. So that would in, that would suggest a maybe a squiggly line. Where's the squiggly line? Well, it looks like it's right there. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but we have a problem because remember that. I mean, that's that's not hard to do. That's that's pretty easy to do. It's it's pretty easy to make a grignard, make a grignard, and then attack. Have the grignard attack a three carbon piece, right? And what three carbon piece is it? It's you know what are the grignard things that grignards attack? Uh, that you know well there's ketones, aldehydes, epoxides, and now we know carbon dioxide, CO2, you know, they attack nitriles, there's all these things that Grignards attack. What is the thing we attack to make a tertiary alcohol like this? Well, it's probably going to look like that, with those atoms, three atoms in a row, and, it, and it, you know, ketone, aldehyde, epoxide, nitrile, etc. Well, a tertiary alcohol like that, that would be a ketone. You'd attack acetone, three carbon electrophile acetone. So in the back of our mind, let's just write, you know, that's going to be what we're going to use as our electrophile. Okay, but anyway, so, but we can't do that with this hydroxy group, because the hydroxy group gets in the way of a Grignard. So let's protect the alcohol, do some stuff, and then deprotect it. Okay, so how do we put on a benzyl protecting group? It's an ether. It's just organic one. How do you make an ether? Well, base and then benzyl bromide. The base is probably NaH, NaH, sodium hydride. So the base takes off the, the proton from oxygen, makes O minus, O minus attacks, SN2, Williamson ether synthesis. Remember that? Okay, and now, now we're, we're excited because now we can do our Grignard stuff easily and the, and the ether won't get in the way of a Grignard, so now it's just magnesium. Okay, we got our, green, our happy Grignard with the benzyl ether protection. What's the thing we have to attack with the Grignard? Oh, it's acetone, remember? So we determined that earlier in our strategic planning of this. So yeah, acetone. And then water is the second step of the Grignard. So now it's starting to look like, well, I'll do, the, I'll do that mechanism arrow. Right. Attack the three carbon piece. So now it's going to look basically like the product. Okay. Except we have the protecting group. How do we take off the protecting group? How do we learn? We just learned how to do it. How do you deprotect a benzyl ether? HG palladium on carbon. So HG palladium on carbon deprotects the uh, benzyl ether and gives us our nice primary alcohol. So that was a pretty cool synthesis that just used um, that just used uh, the uh, benzyl ether as a protecting group. Okay. There's another example of 
using a benzyl ether as a protecting group. I, I'm not going to do it because it's in the it's in the book. I think it's section 22. Two. Uh, I'll, I'll just outline the basic idea of it. So it's. This molecule um, to make this uh, tertiary alcohol. Okay, and so. It uh, the the main thing is that it they they uh, they protect the secondary alcohol. They use a benzyl ether. Then they just do some various stuff to eventually install the tertiary alcohol. So it's it's essentially that is a strategy. Uh, it's too much time for me to go through, but you can check it out. It's section twenty two two. This molecule is um, is called uh, eudesmane. I think it's a perfume or something. So it's like an example of a perfume synthesis. But yeah, it's like uh, essentially protection of the secondary alcohol. And they do a bunch of stuff and eventually Take off the protecting group at the end, and it's done. Okay, H2 palladium. Okay, so yeah, that one is just an example in the book. All right. Uh, moving onward. So number seven is naming. Now we're now we're moving into phenols. Naming phenols. We're going to do very minimal naming in this lecture. I just want to mention a couple of them. What is a phenol? It's a benzene alcohol, right? So if you're thinking about the parent compound, this is just called phenol. Uh, if we were trying to name 3-bromophenol, what do you think that would be? Well, it would be a bromine at the three position, sometimes it's also called M bromophenol, meta bromophenol, right? Um, three, four dimethylphenol. Methyl methyl. So things like that. The book has more examples. Um, I'm going to skip that. It's not that exciting uh, uh, example of nomenclature. Okay. Let's go onward though to uh, a little bit of physical properties. Number eight properties of phenols. What's the uh, pKa of a normal alcohol? Like cyclohexanol, pKa roughly, roughly the same as ethanol or something like that. It's roughly 15 to 17. pKa 15 to 17 or so. And what about the pKa of a phenol? More acidic, less acidic. Any guesses? Um, it is about 9, 9 or 10. So is that more acidic or less acidic? It's quite a bit more acidic, and that's, uh, well, usually. When we think about acidity in organic chemistry, we think about resonance stabilization of the conjugate base, and that's going to be the case here. 
when you when you deprotonate the alcohol to make a conjugate base, is resin stabilized. So uh, think about water and the equilibrium that occurs to make a conjugate base. Right, so the, the water takes the proton off, you make a phenoxide anion. Phenoxide. Well, this has a bunch of resonance structures, right? So this goes there, this goes there. This goes there, this goes there, etc., etc. It's a uh, resonance stabilized conjugate base. Okay, and that explains most of the acidity in organic chemistry. Resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. Okay, what if we have a, um, a phenol? with a nitro group at the end on the para position a nitro para nitro phenol para nitro phenol we call it four nitro phenol okay um, more acidic less acidic than nine or ten and the answer is it's more acidic it's about seven so it's more acidic, it's a little more acidic, it's 100 times more acidic if you consider it logarithmically. Well, and the way we consider that is, imagine deprotonation Okay, and we even have more, more resonance. Do the same exact thing I was doing up here, but you can push the O minus all the way to the nitro and onto the nitrogen atoms. I'm not going to do that for you, uh, but that that explains the higher acidity of paranitrophenol. Higher, it's more acidic. Okay, what about? And that's an electron withdrawing group, uh, EWG. Electron withdrawing group, right? It's withdrawing electrons. Nitro is considered an electron withdrawing group, okay? What about if you have an electron donating group? EDG. Electron donating group. O methyl. O methyl. O methyl. A methyl ether. OME. Is that going to have a is that going to uh, make it more acidic or less acidic? Because before initially we had a normal phenols, pKa 9 or 10. Now we have a EWG, electron withdrawing group, and it's around 7. So this should maybe have the opposite effect, and it does. So the pKa of this is about 10.2. Ten point five, I think, or something like that. So it's it's a little bit um, uh, less acidic. Well, definitely less acidic than the paranitro, and it's less acidic than the starting phenol. And that is because when you take off the negative charge, sorry, the hydroxy, the hydrogen. You take off the hydrogen, right? Water takes off the hydrogen and you get a conjugate base um, now it's kind of like, the way I draw is kind of like the negative charge is being pushed in and the, this is also pushing electrons in and this is a sort of a destabilizing effect because you're donating electron density in with methoxy and this is donating electron density in too, and overall that's a destabilizing effect. Destabilized conjugate base. Okay, so whereas nitro 
is electron withdrawing and kind of electron withdrawing this negative charge onto it and this is, it's a stabilizing effect giving it a lower pKa methoxy is doing the opposite and it's kind of uh, destabilizing the, the um, conjugate base a little bit and so we're get, getting a larger larger pKa so it's, it's actually less acidic so this is a less happy conjugate base okay. Okay, I think we're done for today. All right, I'll continue next time. And what we're going to do is get into um, some of the reactions and um, kind of methods to prepare phenols. How do, how do we actually make phenols on a, you know, put them onto a molecule? You've never seen that before. You've never seen, like, the formation of a phenol as a something we can, like, attach to a molecule, right? Um, so yeah, we're, we're moving on, we're going to do phenols, we're going to do uh, other ways to kind of attach things to benzenes. That's, that's different than what we learned before, because what we learned before was uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution, EAS, and we're going to do some things that are not electrophilic aromatic substitution. That'll be on uh, the next lecture. Alright, see you guys.